for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Sometimes these words don't really hit us, don't really resonate unless we listen carefully. So hear it again. For freedom, for freedom, for the sake of freedom, literally, for freedom Christ has set us free, has given us freedom, has released us, has loosed our bounds, has let us go, has released the grip. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, stand resolute, stand fast, stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. In the letter to the Galatians, we've been hearing about how these Gentile Christians had been converted, had been transformed, had been received into the family of God, had been received into the family of faith, had come to believe in Yahweh, had come to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, had done so with faith, depending upon God's grace, and had received Jesus and had been transformed while, while themselves being received into the family of faith. And then Paul would leave, and along after him would come the brethren of James, the circumcision party, those who were Jewish Christians who believed that while you might be able to be saved, you might be able to enter into the family of faith with faith by grace to complete it, to really become Christian, to truly continue being a Christian, you had also to become a Jew. You had to start keeping the Torah, the, the Jewish law, the Mosaic covenant, the dietary regulations and the circumcision laws and the blood purity laws and the regulations on when you had feast days and high holy days and Sabbath days and how you were to act and behave in certain circumstances and instances, what you did about blood when it would come out of you, what you had to do to cleanse yourself if you touched someone who had blood coming out of them. And they followed these rules and these regulations and they applied these rules and these regulations to these Gentile Christians and said, it's good that you have been received into the family of faith. It's good that you have faith in Jesus Christ. But now to really move forward, to become perfect in Christ, to really be a Christian, you've got to become a Jew too. Man, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to start cooking kosher. You've got to start wearing clothing of one kind of thread. You've got to start planting your field with one kind of seed. You've got to start doing all the things that good Jews do to keep themselves pure from blood pollution. You've got to do all the things that good Jews do in order to really be a Christian, to really have it. You've got to be a Jew too. And Paul asks the simple question, who has bewitched you? Who has perverted the gospel of Christ? Who has taken it and turned it into something that is not the gospel? But instead a troubling message which brings not salvation and not sanctification. But if it is followed to its end, damnation. And we heard last week about the role of the law and how the law as a schoolmaster teaches us about our need for grace, our need for Christ, our need to have faith in Jesus the reality that we are lost in our sins and incapable of saving ourselves and all we can do is turn to Jesus and trust in God and know that if we do this we are covered if we do this if we accept by faith the grace of God through Jesus Christ we have nothing to fear doing good works won't save us doing good works won't sanctify us doing good works won't make us better Christians faith empowered by God's grace, not only brings us into the family of faith, but moves us forward in the family of faith. And good works do indeed flow from that, empowered by grace, but they don't make us Christian and they don't make us better. 
So Paul dealt with the issue of the law, the role of the law, the place of the law. The law is good. The law was given by an angel. The law should be paid attention to, but it doesn't save and it doesn't sanctify. And today Paul then picks up here in chapter 4 at verse 21 and says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, will you not listen to the law? After all, if you're going to be saved by keeping the law, you've got to keep all of it. This is what he said back in chapter 3. You've got to keep it all. You can't go, okay, I want to keep this law and this law and this law and this law. And I want to make sure that he keeps this law and she keeps that law and he keeps this law. And this guy over here better keep that law. But I don't want to keep this one and 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 this one. You can't pick and choose from the law the parts you want to keep, the parts you want others to keep, and the parts you want to ignore. You can't do it. You've got to keep it all. And it's not just a matter of getting close to what the law says you're supposed to do, getting close to what the law says you're supposed to be. No, close counts only in horseshoes and nuclear weapons, friends. You've got to keep it all. 100%. The bullseye on the target. You get off course once. You fall short, hit the ground between you and the target once. You don't hit the exact center every time you fail to keep the law. And one blemish, one failure, if you're depending upon keeping the law to save you, one blemish and one failure is enough to doom you. Ooh. Yuck. That sounds awfully hard. Yep. It's why Jesus came. For while Jesus can indeed keep the law, and did indeed keep the law, we cannot. Oh, we can try. We can make a good faith effort. That's what the Pharisees were about. They were about interpreting the law and trying to adjust the law so that it would be possible to try to keep it at least some of the time. And there was nothing wrong with that idea. But my brothers and sisters, keeping it in order to attain salvation, keeping it in order to become perfect, is a losing proposition for all of us. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. And we continue to go astray. Which brings us to where Paul is today, here in chapter 4 of the letter to the Galatians. For he says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, will you not listen to the law? Okay, if you want to live under the law, let's take a look at one of the most important persons in the entire Hebrew faith. Let's take a look at Abraham himself. Abraham was given a whole bunch of promises. Abraham was promised that he'd have children like the stars up in the sky and the sands by the seashore. He was promised that his descendants would become a great nation and that all the people of the world would be blessed by him. He was promised that even though he was 100 years old and Sarah, his wife, was 90 years old and she was barren and had never had any kids, he was promised, nevertheless, he would be the father of many nations. Now, you know, Sarah and Abram were having a conversation about this, and Sarah goes, you know, God's crazy. I am barren, and I'm old, and you're older. And does God think that you and I can have a kid? But guess what, Abram? I've got a young Egyptian handmaid. Let her serve as a surrogate for me. And you go with her, and you have a kid with her, and we'll raise it and get God's job done for God. Because God doesn't understand menopause. God doesn't understand barrenness. None of that. So we will take Hagar and she'll be me for you. And you'll have a kid with her. And God, who doesn't know any better, will now have a kid for you that way. Getting God's job done for God because God can't get it done for God's self. Wow. Wow. That's what happened, essentially. And I'm sure that Sarai did not have to beat on Abram to get him to go do that either. And so he and Hagar 
had a kid. They do what people do. And the birth of the child Ishmael occurred. Abram and Hagar had Ishmael, Abram's firstborn son. Wow. Well, that wasn't God's plan. It may have been Abram's plan, but it wasn't God's plan. And so God said, not Hagar. Oh, Ishmael will have many promises. And God made some wonderful promises to Hagar and Ishmael about the people that would come from Ishmael and how, what a kind of people they would be, how powerful they would be. But not through Ishmael will the promises of God to Abraham be fulfilled. The promises of children like the stars up in the sky and the sands by the seashore, the, child, the promise of being a blessing to the nations will not be fulfilled through Ishmael. No, because the child of promise must come from Abraham and Sarah. God changed their names. You are Abraham and you are Sarah. A blessing to the world. And through Sarah, the promised child will come. And Sarah, having listened to this conversation between God and Abraham, she starts a laughing about it. And God says, why did you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, yes, you did. Am I going to get to have a kid? Uh-huh. Even though you're old, even though it's impossible by way of human thinking, even though menopause done come and gone, you are going to have a miraculous child. And one year later, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, the child of promise. Isaac, the miraculous child, the child for whom in human eyes and human understanding with human power and human strength could not possibly have come about. Ishmael was the product of human abilities. Abram, although old, was still capable and Hagar was young. Was no problem there. Sarah was elderly and barren and the idea of Abram and Sarah having a child together in human thinking was impossible. But God is a God of miracles. Can I get an amen? amen? God is a God of miracles. God works miracles, transforming miracles, miracles that we would never expect God can work in the lives of those who will simply trust Him. Simply turn to him in faith and say, Okay, God, I do not comprehend how this could possibly happen. I do not understand how you're going to make this work. But I know you are the God of miracles. I know you've made these promises. And so I'm going to trust in you and do what you tell me to do. And that's what Abram did and that's what Sarah did. And when they finally did that, after having tried to get God's will done for God their own way and failing... By producing Ishmael, they trusted in God, did what God told them to do, and produced Isaac, the child of promise. This story is the one that, a that Paul takes and uses to make an allegory to explain the situation that was facing the New Testament church in that day and age. The New Testament church made up of Gentiles on the one hand whom Paul had converted from paganism into Christianity without making them Jews first and Jews who had become Christians and were still Jews. He takes these two women and identifies them as two covenants and he says Hagar is the equivalent of Mount Sinai where the law comes from, where Mosaic covenant was established, where the Ten Commandments were given. Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And she is the equal to, she is identifiable with the Jerusalem which is now. Today's Jerusalem. The Jerusalem in his day and age. The Jerusalem leaders. The, the brethren of James. The circumcision party. Those who wanted to establish Judaism as the way of life for Christians. She is the Mosaic covenant. She is the law. 
She is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which is equal to Jerusalem of his day. And then the other woman, Sarah, is the mother of the child of promise. And she is equal to the Jerusalem which is above in heaven, which is established by grace through faith. Not by keeping the law from Mount Sinai, not by keeping the laws established by Jerusalem, but by grace through faith, she is the Jerusalem which is above. And so he says, essentially says, that trying to save yourself or perfect yourself, trying to be saved or be sanctified by keeping the law, by keeping the Torah, by getting circumcised, keeping dietary regulation, blood purity laws, feast days, Sabbath days, holy days, doing all that kind of stuff and all those kind of good works is the equivalent of Abram and Hagar creating Ishmael in the tent. Ooh, that must have caused those Jewish Christians to back up and go, wait a minute, we're children of Isaac. Yes, you are. We are children of Sarah and Abraham. Yes, you are biologically. But allegorically, in this kind of a metaphor that he's establishing, you are trying to do what Abram and Hagar did. You're trying to get God's will done the human way with human understanding and human abilities. Not God's way with divine understanding and divine abilities. The human way through works, not God's way through grace and faith. You are the equivalent of Abram and Hagar creating Ishmael, not Abraham and Sarah, by faith in God's miraculous action creating Isaac. It's the Christians who believe, the Christians who faith, the Christians who trust in Jesus. They are the children, the true children of Isaac. They are the true children of Abraham and Sarah. They are the true, true children of promise because they're doing it, they are living life, they are serving as Christians just as Abraham and Sarah finally did when they said, okay, we don't understand it, but God will make it possible by a miraculous act if we will simply trust Him and act in faith. My friends, Paul was slapping upside the head those Jewish Christians and letting them know, letting them see, letting them hear, while also saying to the Gentile Christians, he was explaining and proclaiming that saving yourself by doing good works is not only impossible, it's the equivalent of Abraham and Hagar making Ishmael. But living by faith, depending upon God's grace, trusting in Jesus is the equivalent of Abraham and Sarah by faith in God's miraculous act producing Isaac. This must have been so very hard for those Jewish Christians to hear but so very freeing for the Gentile Christians and for anyone, Jew or Gentile, who believes in Jesus and trusts in Jesus and lives their life depending upon God's grace and not upon their works for salvation or sanctification. This is the essence of Paul's message to the Galatians. It's the essence of what he means when he says, for freedom, because of freedom, through freedom, Christ has set us free. We're free from the yoke of having to keep the law for salvation or sanctification. We're free from having to try to approximate the Torah to try to save ourselves or make ourselves perfect. We can't do it. We're free from the yoke of slavery to the law. We're free to live to Christ. Well, Greg, that's awfully convenient. That's awfully convenient. I mean, if someone's really a Christian, they may be able to get in through the door of the family of God by faith, depending on, upon God's grace. They may be able to get in through the door on faith, but once they're inside, by cracker, they ought to act like it. They ought to stop doing a whole list of things, start doing a whole list of other things, and behave like I think they ought to behave. Well, who made you that arbiter, friend? But well, that's what the church does. We spend too much time 
telling other people how they should live their lives, telling other people what they should be doing and not doing, instead of trusting in Jesus and worrying about ourselves. Too much of the church sets up a litmus test and a list of rules and regulations and says, if you don't do these or you do do these, you're in trouble and you can't be a part of the church. Paul says that's between us and God. That we are called to live by faith, trust in His grace. And just as was true with Sarah and Abraham in a miraculous birth of Isaac, if God wants to change something in us, guess what? God can do it. Because God is a God of miracles. We may try to do it ourselves and we will fail every time. But God, the God of miracles, can work changes in our lives. Can change broken lives and broken families and broken hearts and broken dreams. God, the God of miracles, the God who made Abraham and Sarah produce Isaac, God, the God of miracles, can change us if God wants to. Too many people are trying to make other people change into some image that they think these people ought to be. Sorry, friends. If God wants someone to change, God will change them. Don't need us in there trying to make it happen because we can't do it. All we're supposed to do is proclaim Jesus, live by faith, trust in God's grace, and worry about our own relationship with God, meanwhile sharing the love of God with all and telling others what Jesus has done for them. That's what we're called to do as the church. If only the church of Jesus Christ, universal, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, you name it, if only the church would profess its faith, live by grace, show forth the love of God, and let God work on others as God will work on us. My brothers and sisters, that's what the message of Galatians is about. It's a message of freedom. Freedom from the yoke of slavery, the, lo the yoke of the law, and freedom to live in Christ Jesus. Freedom from the law and freedom from sin. Freedom to live in Christ Jesus, trusting in His grace, living by faith. If we will only do that as the family of God, proclaim the love of God to all, witness to the love of God to all because all need to hear it if we will do that and they will hear it and by grace live in faith listen and believe then my friends God the God of miracles can and will work miracles in not only our lives but in their lives too so my brothers and sisters hear this message from Paul for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. If someone wants to yoke you, someone wants to enslave you, someone wants to tie you down with the law and say you've got to do this and got to do that, do what Paul says. Do what Paul says that Sarah did when Ishmael picked on Isaac because Isaac wasn't firstborn. Kick him out. <gasps> yeah. Refuse to accept their message, their word, their judgmentalism. Say, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Can you do better? And if they are truly honest, that's the problem, many of them aren't. If they are truly honest, they'll have to say no. My brothers and sisters, stand firm in faith. Stand firm on God's grace. Trust in Jesus. And let the God of miracles work in your life, in the life of this family of faith, in the life of our nation, in the life of the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
and let God's people say, In your presence, Lord, let me learn at your feet. I will taste the riches of your word by your grace upon You have been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2013 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at Northgate United Methodist Church, 3700 West Northgate Drive, Irving, Texas, 75062. This program was produced by Dr. Gregory Neal.